Hey everyone, my name is Eric, and let's imagine that I'm making the world's next book sharing social network, BookHub. With BookHub, you can share books you're reading with your friends, get recommendations, and eventually you'll be able to buy ebooks and audiobooks as well. And I've been working on the first version of my Android app, and I just sent out the first build to my beta testers, but I'm getting some feedback that my app isn't working quite right. So let me open it up here on my phone uh, and check. Um, so I'm just going to open up BookHub, and oh shoot, it's not working. Um, looks like I maybe sent them my test build by mistake. And yeah, if I look over here in my source code, looks like I've got the wrong value here for this constant. Um, dang. So what can I do to fix this? Well, I could make a new APK build and send it out to all my testers again and hope they install it, but it will take a while to get everyone to do that again and more steps are just gonna make people lose confidence in my idea, um, and everyone's waiting on me, and they're gonna give up and move on soon. So I need to find a faster solution. Fortunately, um, I used Expo updates in my app, uh, and that means that I can push out a quick over the air update, and everyone will receive it immediately. So I'm just gonna go ahead and change this constant back to the correct value, um, and then go over to my terminal and run Expo publish. And this is just going to take a second, and it will publish and deploy an update to my app over the air. Um, and I'm actually going to cheat a little and fast forward here, so now it's done. And then all my testers have to do is close and then reopen the app on their phone, and ta-da, they'll have the update. Awesome. So how did I do this? Well, I deployed an over-the-air update to my app using Expo Updates, which is a library that does exactly that. It lets you push updates to your app over the air. Um, and this concept is not new to React Native. Uh, if you developed your app using the Expo client and you build your app using Expo Build iOS or Expo Build Android, then you already have over the air updates built in. Um, and you've probably used them anytime you run Expo Publish, just like I just did. And in fact, that's how I made BookHub um, and that's how I applied an over the air update. Um, but what if you need to modify native code? This is something that you can't do with Expo's normal managed workflow because you're restricted to the set of native modules that are pre-installed by Expo. But as part of Expo's mission to modularize our SDK, uh, I wrote and recently released a new library called Expo Updates that takes the over-the-air updates functionality from the managed workflow and brings it to a single portable module that you can install from NPM in any React Native project. So now you can use Expo's over the air updates in any React Native app. Um, so you may know that there are many ways to start a new React Native project. There is React Native init, create React Native app, ignite, Expo init with a bare template, there's plain Expo init, and there are probably many more as well. Um, and I'm not gonna go over all the differences between these methods in this talk, uh, but essentially these four on the left give you um, roughly equivalent projects that all have full access and control over your native code. Um, and Expo init abstracts away the native code with the idea that many developers can get started without it and just focus on JavaScript. Uh, but the important thing here is that in all cases, you can use Expo updates just the same. It's built into all projects that you get from Expo init, but if you created your project in any other way, uh, for example, like I'm doing here with React Native init, then all you need to do is install Expo updates like any other Expo module um, and set it up following um, a couple of setup instructions in the README um, and you'll be good to go. Uh, so for BookHub, I started out with a managed Expo project created with Expo init um, because even though I know I'm gonna need to add some native code eventually, this does everything I need to get going right now. One other nice thing about projects created with Expo init is that it's very easy to move over to this other kind of project on the left later on whenever I do need to modify native code. And we'll cover that in a few minutes. Um, but in any case, Expo init has updates built in, so I've had updates available to me from the beginning without having to install anything, so that's great. Cool, so you might have noticed that when I started up the BookHub app the second time just now, after I deployed the update, which I'll replay, there was a little delay while it was downloading the new update that I just published. And for some apps and situations, that might be okay. But on the other hand, I know that when I do a public release of BookHub, 
TTI is going to be really important for me, and TTI is timed interactive. I know that if my app sits on the splash screen for a while, uh, people can get impatient and switch to something else pretty quickly. Um, fortunately, Expo Updates provides a configurable timeout for checking for updates. So in my test build, I set that timeout to 3000 milliseconds. And what that means is when I open the app, it will check for an update and try to download it, but only for a maximum of three seconds. And after that time, no matter what, the app will launch. And that means it might fall back to launching a previously downloaded version of the app. So to illustrate more concretely, if I open the app and there's a new update available, it will start downloading it right away, like it did when I launched the test build. And if it finishes downloading before the three seconds have elapsed, it will launch the app as soon as it's finished. But say the internet connection is bad and it's taking a long time to download. Then after three seconds, it will launch the previous version of the app that it already has downloaded on disk. Um, but it will keep downloading the new update in the background so that that will be ready the next time the app launches. And this behavior is sort of like loading a website, though most browsers have a longer timeout than three seconds. Um, but you can set the timeout to anything you want, so it's helpful to think of this as the website policy for loading apps. And since the build that I made before was for testers, it was really important to me that they get the update as soon as I release it. Um, so that's why I chose the website policy. But this isn't the policy that I want for my public release, because in both cases that I illustrated, my TTI is longer than I want. And what I really want for my public release is for my TTI to be as small as possible. So what I'm going to do is set the timeout to zero. And what that will do is whenever the app is opened, it's just going to launch right away with a previously downloaded version. And it will still check for an update, but that will always happen in the background. And any update that's downloaded will be applied the next time the app launches. This behavior is more like a desktop app, like Slack or Zoom or something like that, as opposed to a website. So you can think of this as the desktop policy for loading updates. Um, and the trade-off between these two policies is one of correctness versus performance. Um, with a website policy, I'm more likely to get the correct, most up-to-date version of the app each time I launch it. And it's easier for testers and stakeholders to understand, um, but I'm sacrificing TTI a little bit. Um, whereas with the desktop policy, um, I have the best possible TTI every time, but um, the trade-off is I might be a little bit behind on updates sometimes. Um, we've heard that a lot of developers lean towards optimizing TTI in their apps, so the desktop policy or the zero timeout is the default setting in new projects created with Expo updates. But the good news is that you can set the setting to whatever you want, so um, you can choose your own way of dealing with this trade-off. Um, and just in case the built-in options don't cover your use case, Expo Updates also includes a JavaScript API for downloading and applying updates. And this lets you implement your own custom logic around updates directly in your application code. So for example, um, you could show an alert to the user when an update is available, and then let them decide whether to apply it right then or wait. Awesome, so I'm gonna just go ahead and choose the desktop policy for my initial public launch of BookHub, and uh, I'm all set with updates. So now uh, let's say I've done my initial public launch through the Play Store. I've pushed out a few critical bug fixes with updates and everything seems solid. So now I'm ready to launch my ebook marketplace with Google Pay support, uh, which is my next big feature. And I know that I'm gonna need to add native code at this point to my project, so I'm gonna eject. And what Expo Eject will do is give me a plain React Native project with all my same Expo modules installed, but it will give me full control over the native projects. One quick side note here, um, ejecting an Expo project used to give you um, a native project with this heavyweight library called Expo Kit, um, but it no longer does so. Um, instead, if you remember this slide from a few minutes ago, um, when I said it's easy to switch over to the native project workflow later on, Expo Eject is how you do that. So in other words, running Expo init and then Expo Eject gives you essentially the same thing as running React Native init and then installing whatever Expo modules you use, such as Expo Updates. So all I need to do 
with my book hub project is run expo eject, and then it will spit out my native projects for me, and I can add the Google Pay module and any other native code uh, as I please. Cool, so let's say that I've properly installed and set up the Google Pay module, and I've added the payment functionality into my JavaScript logic. So now I'm all ready to release the ebook marketplace functionality to my users. Um, but again, this module includes native code. So if I try and release my new up feature as an over-the-air update, um, like the same way I've been pushing out bug fixes, what's gonna happen? Uh, well, let's take a look. If I take my JavaScript update, which uses functions on the Google Pay module, and try to apply it to binary version 1.0, which I released before through the Play Store, well, my Google Pay functions aren't gonna work because the binary doesn't have the Google Pay native code. So I need to release a new binary version, version 2.0, through the Play Store that does have the Google Pay native code. And then I can run my JavaScript update that has Google Pay functions on binary version 2.0. Cool, um, but there's a caveat. From here on out, I need to be careful about publishing over-the-air updates. Um, because I can't control binary updates that go out through Google Play, meaning I can't control when they will go out and when everyone will download them, um, I kind of need to assume that out in the wild, there will always be multiple different binary versions running on people's phones that I need to support. And this is just an inherent complexity with releasing apps through avenues like the Play Store. And this matters here because I need to support binary one still. If I publish an over-the-air update to binary two that includes these Google Pay function calls, but that same update also goes out to binary one, it's not gonna work and it's gonna cause issues. So how can I prevent this update from being applied? Well, one way I can do that is by using release channels. Um, release channels are a feature of Expo's update service that are sort of like Git branches. When you make a build, um, you can point the build to a specific release channel, and it will always pull the latest update from that channel, which you can think of like pulling the head of that branch. And then anytime you publish a new update to that release channel, it's like pushing a new commit onto the head of that branch. And the use case here of release channels is to restrict updates to specific binary builds. So if I create a new release channel for every binary I build, then anytime I publish a new update, I can choose exactly which binaries it should be distributed to by publishing to a specific release channel. Um, so what I want is one release channel for binary version 1.0 and one for binary version 2.0. I could call them prod 1.0 and prod 2.0 or something like that. Um, then I'll publish to the prod 2.0 channel and only my version 2.0 binaries will get the update and binary 1.0 will be left untouched. Um, great, so this is exactly what I want. Um, and the idea is that each time in the future that I create a new binary with new native code, um, I'll create a new release channel. So for example, if I eventually have a version 3.0 with some sort of camera functionality, um, I'll create a release channel for 3.0 as well. Cool, so this solves my problem, um, but I can do even better. Um, I can set up a GitHub action to deploy updates to the right release channel automatically for me. Cedric Van Putten, who's awesome, has created an Expo GitHub action um, that's available if you search for it here on the GitHub action marketplace. Um, and I can easily use it to make a GitHub action like this one that publishes updates automatically whenever I push to GitHub. So um, I'm just gonna push a commit with my bug fix to GitHub, and then it will publish automatically. Uh, and a couple minutes later, after the workflow on GitHub finishes, um, and I'm fast forwarding here again, um, all I need to do is then just open up the app on my phone and I'll have the update. Awesome. Um, and again, all I had to do here was push my commit to GitHub. So that's super cool. Uh, but even better, um, I can use the branch name as the release channel. So if I wanna publish to my prod 2.0 release channel that I created before, um, all I need to do is just push my commit to the prod 2.0 branch, and then GitHub Actions again will publish the update and deploy it to production. Um, and still better, um, I can have release channels for staging and internal test builds too. So I could push my commit to the staging 2.0 channel, then ping my PM who has the staging build on their phone already, and then within like three minutes, they'll have the update on their phone, they give me the okay, and then I just push the commit to prod 2.0 channel, 
um, or branch, I mean, and it's out to all my users in another three minutes. So all that with just a couple of GitHub pushes. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I could even do something like set up a GitHub action that looks for changes to my native modules and bumps the release channel version automatically. Um, and I'm not anticipating many changes to my native modules, so I'm not gonna do that right now, um, but that's something that I could do in the future. So you can see how this is just like the tip of the iceberg uh, and these tools open up so many possibilities for super fast and nice workflows. Awesome, so uh, I have a really slick workflow now. Uh, I'm all set up to make lots of changes and publish and deploy them to my users in record time. Uh, I'm able to iterate quickly on my app. It's growing a lot. I've got lots of new features, lots of users. Uh, and now some exciting news. BookHub is getting acquired by Megatech. Um, and so that's really exciting for me. Uh, but Megatech's policy is that everything has to be hosted internally. So I can't keep using Expo's hosting service to host my over-the-air updates. Um, but fortunately, I can still use the Expo Updates client-side library. Uh, and this is because Expo is really two things. Um, Expo is a platform and an SDK for making native apps that run on Android, iOS, and the web. Uh, and it's also Expo Application Services, or EAS, which is a suite of managed services for doing things like building your app, uh, hosting updates, uh, and other things for developers who want to use managed services instead of their own computers. Um, and the Expo platform and EAS are designed to work well together, uh, but they're certainly not tied together. Uh, in fact, EAS is just a convenient implementation of a bunch of protocols that the clients expect. So I can use the Expo SDK and client-side modules, including Expo updates, without being tied to Expo services in any way. Um, and so what that means is that even though Expo updates works well with EAS, they're not coupled together, and I can po point Expo updates to any server I want to download over-the-air updates from. Uh, as long as my server conforms to the standard protocol that Expo Updates expects, I can host all my own code from Megatech servers, and Expo Updates will take care of loading the code on the client, just as it would for apps hosted on EAS. So I can host my updates myself from inside Megatech or anywhere I want. So uh, I hope that this has given you a glimpse into what's possible with Expo's over-the-air updates. Uh, thanks to Expo Updates, I can build a production app all the way from inception to acquisition and beyond uh, with Expo by my side all the way along. Um, I can easily deploy over-the-air updates to internal testers and to all my users on multiple different binary versions. Um, and I can host updates uh, on my own server or my employer's server if I want. And even if I'd started from React Native init instead of Expo init, um, I could have used Expo updates in just the same way, and hardly anything in this talk would have changed. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's so much more potential out there. There are so many more features and things that I want to build into the Expo updates library, um, and this is just the beginning. So I hope you give it a try. Uh, let us know if you find it useful, let us know what else you want from it, and let us know what cool things you're building. Thanks so much for listening. I was wondering if you could just ask answer one React Native question for me, and then I'll go to the other questions. And that sure. is, um, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with building uh, either Android or iOS apps, and I'm I'm mostly been a web developer for almost 20 years, so I'm almost afraid to go over there. How much do I really have to know as a just a web developer getting involved with React Native, um, and when will I run into situations where I have to deal with native code? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in general, like the paradigms of React programming um, translate very well and easily between um, React Web and React Native. And the main differences are just the um, uh, the components that you work with and the primitives um, rather than like HTML elements, you'll use more um, abstract uh, things like view and text and image. Yes. Um, but but most of the like paradigms and the ways that you program will translate well. So it would be um, a pretty uh, pretty easy transition, I think. So I, I get to do 90% or more of my programming all in React and uh, yeah. just have to understand yeah. some uh, small differences between maybe um, build it, you know, uh, inserting a paragraph versus an actual text, uh, I guess, text component or something like that. 
Right, right, yeah. Um, and the places where native code comes in um, are when you need to use like functionality that's specific to the device. Um, okay. Like, like the camera or like location information. Um, and uh, Expo like has a lot of the native functionality of, um, of most devices built in, um, but, uh, but people have many different use Got it. things yeah. you, said right. there are, you said there are many features you would like to add in the future could you tell us a bit about which yeah one yeah to me? yeah for sure um we would love to add um more sort of diverse ways of pushing updates to users um so we'd love to add in first class support for like mandatory updates that um that sort of override the timeout settings that um, that I talked about at one point in the talk um, and uh, you know are always pushed to users right away in case there's like a really important bug fix that people need to get out. Um, we'd love to add support for um, pushing notifications or sorry pushing uh, updates to um, to users um, using push notifications to download them in the background. Um, rather than sort of the pull model that we have now, where updates are pulled when you launch the app. Um, and what else? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of blanking right now, but. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. We had uh, just, we had Michel this morning. Uh, he was demoing Flipper. And yep. he said that it, it wasn't working at least for now with the Expo client. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, we're uh, we're working on that. Um, we are uh, we're prioritizing support for I think the bear workflow right now, which is um, a workflow where you can use uh, any Expo module you want, but have like a plain React Native project and um, build all your native code, and you can use Flipper in that sense uh, in that workflow. Um, and okay. yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think we have a, an ETA for um, Flipper support in the Expo client. We had a question from the Discord server. Um, how does Expo update compare with tools like CodePush? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I think the the important thing is that Expo updates is like focused completely and built entirely for uh, React Native and Expo apps, and so it will like work out of the box um, with apps at all places along the sort of app development journey that that we sort of took on this talk. Um, whereas CodePush has like a broader focus, um, it supports Cordova as well as React Native. Um, yeah. I'm not personally an expert on CodePush, and so I can't give like a detailed breakdown of the differences. No, I think that's a, that's a good, but that's, I mean, good kind of uh, high level view of it. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your talk. And awesome. um, yeah, thanks. Do you so have any uh, any information that you want to make available, like uh, slides for the talk or anything like that? Um, I can. Yeah, I can make the slides for the talk available if that would be. Sure. Helpful. If you have any of those links, you can send them to myself or Patrick, and we'll get them uh, plugged into the Discord server or the YouTube channel. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thanks for joining us, Eric.